Hopefully, we're, it's not going to be negative. We're not going to. We're not going to just junk on stuff. Yeah, we're trying. Going to try not to. I'm going to try to be nice. Um, we got five minutes though, so help yourself, and we'll get started here in a sec. <clears throat>
Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Thought they came to hear me talk. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the uh, um, first one, I want to thank my sponsors, Kukin and Windsor and Rockwell, for putting on this event. They're the ones that pay for the beer, so thank you for those guys doing that. Um, so this is, uh, uh, you know, after 1960, um, talking about houses and, and kind of what happened to what happens to houses, and um, well, uh, you know, really we're going to be talking about these and and the challenges of building today, like like uh, why it's hard to get a good house, why it's hard to get a, a beautiful house today, and I don't want to be all negative, so we are going to talk about some positive things that I think are happening out there. Um, I put this on the cover of the invitation, of the, if you saw our newsletter, and some people are like, you know that's not a good looking house, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and um, you know, uh, <laughs> yes, I do know that. Um, I, I do these Wednesday videos on YouTube uh, about fixing houses and uh, it started with just some consulting houses I was working on and some people said what could you do with like new houses like built in the 80s and 90s and so I started playing around with some of these um, but you know how do we get to a thing where we've got two Palladian windows uh, in this you know right on the same facade right how do we get to a point where the front doors hidden and gone um, how nearly every window is arched, um, you know, what's happened, you know, and, and what style is that? Yeah, it's the early, early crap period, um, right? And so we've gotten to a point where our houses don't really have a style. They're, they're, they're you know, and they are um, very showy from the front. And so, you know, just what happened? How do we get here? And so, you know, this is a recap because this whole thing started however long ago. How long have we been doing this? About a year and a half. Um, and we started with the Georgian style, right? We started with Georgian and then we did federal and Greek revival. That whole, you know, pre-industrial era when we used to hand make homes and hand build things. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the industrialization, the changes in building from timber frame to balloon framing. Um, we talked about Victorian, the arts and crafts even into the William Levitt and the modernism, okay? So uh, we've kind of looked back and this is now, you know, we've, we've looked, looked in the past and now we're gonna look forward a little bit and, uh, and to, to what's happening. Since 1960, you had, you know, basically suburbanization, uh, the flight to suburbia, um, you know, the importance of the car uh, I did one video, if you look at, you know, entry level houses, the, the, the garage is on the very front of these houses. And the importance of the car and how it's changed our neighborhoods and how it's changed our cities is, is significant. Um, rise of the McMansion, right, the starter castles. Uh, why are there McMansions, right? Why, uh, why do we build McMansions? You know, who started that? Um, there's obviously the housing crisis. Sarah Suzanka's book, The Not So Big House, I think is a big deal. Um, you know, her, her idea of, look, you know, we're building these houses, we've got a formal dining room. No one uses the formal dining room anymore. It's a waste of money. And kind of rethinking how houses should be built. And I think, you know, Chip and Joanna Gaines are even uh, important uh, because of what they signal, important because of what, they, uh, what, the, what it represents. Um, from them as far as, uh, you know, kind of not really the flipper, but, but an appreciation of older houses, an appreciation of older things. The fact that, you know, shiplap became such a, uh, a popular thing with them, I think is, is an interesting commentary on what we think about houses, what we love, um, what people appreciate, what's charming. And so, Right, and so all of these different things. There, there has been, in my mind, really no great design leaders, right, in this time. Um, you know, Chip and Joanna, yeah, they're design leaders, and so, which is interesting. Um, and so I, I, find that, I find that fascinating. Um, 
there's really two reasons why it's hard to get a beautiful house today. And, you know, Levittown, the rise of the production builders, um, you know, they, they, you know, we, we did, we spent a whole episode on Levitt and it, it's, it's, he's a fascinating character because, you know, on one side, he solved this housing crisis. On the other side, he taught, you know, everybody how to build cheap and fast. And we're still fighting that. And then, you know, so you have the builder up here and the, the rise of the production builder. And then you have the architect down here and the rise of modernism. And the fact that they're, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the traditional and the classical is, it was pushed aside. And we talked about that when we went through modernism. But the builder is building cheap and fast. The architect is not trained in traditional things. And yet the customer still expects to get a traditional house. Still expects, you know, wants a, you know, Georgian house and no one knows how to build it. And so uh, it's, a, it's a troubling time. Um, you know, Levitt uh, was the most prolific and the most, uh, um, uh, you know, photogenic maybe. Um, it, he was a, a ham for the press and everything else. He worked them beautifully. But these houses, you know, this is the beginning of the cookie cutter houses. This is the beginning of, you know, th there wasn't cookie cutter houses before the production builders. Um, and really the McMansion is really nothing bigger, nothing more than, you know, a starter house with more square footage and granite countertops, right? And so, um, you know, the reason we have McMansions is because, you know, builders realized that they could make more money if they put more square footage and then hammed it up. Um, and so, you know, we've got an, an illiterate customer base that, that doesn't really understand, you know, what's going on. And, and so that, that rise of production building, I think these magazine covers represent the, you know, cataclysmic change that happened between it in a 30 year period from 1927 to 1959, right? That this was all about building charming houses, building beautiful houses that on the cover of a building magazine, you had this wonderful rendering of a really charming, uh, you know, uh, colonial revival house. And here, about business, you know, we're gonna, we got these businessmen, we're very serious about business. Um, building is a business, right? The house is, you know, a ranch-ish, uh, kind of a colonial ranch, maybe. Again, style starting to get a little bit muddy as we go forward, but look at the look at the change that's happened uh, in just 30 years. Um, again, you know, the ability in the 20s and 30s to get the architectural details right, to understand what an English cottage looked like, and you know how it should be put together. And you know, these guys are talking about uh, you know this could be you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, it's crazy, and so you know. The, this, this is a 30 year change, right? We go from, uh, you know, pre Great Depression to, you know, post World War II, and we've changed the way we built, okay? So, can't emphasize enough what changed, what happened, why are we doing this? This 30 year period of time is the reason everything changed. Uh, because the generation two, three after this, this is all they know, and they don't know this. The architects got involved in this too, right? So after we come out of the housing crisis, after we come out of World War II, everybody's wanting to solve the getting more houses out there. And the architects did the case study houses, which were meant to be, you know, uh, prefab, you know, modern designs that could be built cheap and easily. And so, you know, while, you know, on the cutting edge of design, they, they were also modularized so that they could be built over and over again. And these case study houses, I think there was 10 of them done, um, uh, you know, never really took, but everybody was involved in solving the housing crisis. Everybody was involved in, in making things, you know, faster and, and, and better, solving this problem. We need houses. There, there's a huge shortage for you know 20 years since the Great Depression until the end of World War II. We really hadn't been building houses, and so we just had to crank everything up, and everybody got involved. So now you know here, 
60 years later, we are, you know, we, there's a skewed view, in my opinion, of, you know, architecture. And, you know, this to me, you know, defines the hard separation that took place between, you know, classicism and, and classical design, which was, you know, universal, okay, in the 20s and slowly started to be changed in the 30s when Gropius came over and some of the other Germans came over from, from Germany. But this, this was how we built, now this is how we built. And so, you know, it couldn't be more, more, more different. Um, you know, the uh, Farnsworth House, Mies van der Rohe, okay, Levittown. Architect designed, architect driven, builder driven, right? And so the, the, these worlds are separating very quickly and the architect is no longer being trained to even do this. Um, in the 20s, an architect would have studied, uh, you know, this is a Mediterranean revival and would have applied it to a residential house as well as to the commercial building. This is in Fort Worth, that's the Montgomery Wards building. But they did Montgomery Wards buildings, there's like five or six of these, ones in Kansas City, all in that Mediterranean revival style. So you had a corporate architect, a corporate, you know, uh, you know team that was working in these traditional period revival styles. 1920s, Art Deco, right? 1950, United Nations building. Again, just this sharp change that's happened and you know why we no longer build and can build the way we want to do. I've said this before, builders think that because their houses sell, they're well designed. Homeowners think that because someone built it, it must have been designed, okay? So we have the builder going, yeah, my design's great. My, all my houses are selling. And the homeowner's going, well, I guess this is what, you know, someone must have designed this. Um, architects aren't trained, and so we end up with houses that are kind of close, but, but not really as good as they used to be. And so, um, right, so the builder doesn't care, the consumer doesn't know, and the architect's disengaged. So our houses are ugly. Um, you know, this was a 1960s home tour uh, in, in, in Houston um, that I took from the original clipping. Old English. That's old English. Um, and so, you know, the 60s and 70s, I think the 70s are kind of the, the low point in American architectural design. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's just muddy and awful and you get, you get bad things like this. Um, which I don't think work. So we end up with all these different styles today, right, that, that you see, um, and they're, 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 they're going everywhere, right? You see organic, new formalism, deconstructionism, brutalism, right? All these different architectural styles. None of these, uh, you know, whereas in the 1920s, everybody really followed a, a same classical ideal that was a little bit stale that needed to be shaken up, but it certainly you know, didn't require all of this. There's a fascinating book uh, by this lady, Ann Sussman. Someone on YouTube's told me about her, and I, I, I dove, I've, got, I've just started her book. Um, this is her YouTube, this is the YouTube thing, How Humans Experience Architecture. She's working with this thing called iMotions, okay? Now, iMotions is, uh, in, in a lot of, interesting things happening right now with architecture and neuroscience and emotions and you know uh, that are being studied right now uh, Don Ruggles who is an ICA architect in, in Denver wrote this book beauty neuroscience and architecture uh, and, in, and in this book he, he says that we've got uh, that all of us innately have this fight uh, flight or fight attitude and Often what they found is that the, these buildings, the, the modern buildings, uh, cause us to have a flight uh, uh, or fight re reaction instead of a love reaction. So she's done all these, all these studies and, and basically they have this computer that reads the eyes of the person watching whatever they're watching. 
And so they did the Villa Rotunda, and basically they, they, they followed this person's eyes around. And I think in this study, you can watch the YouTube video. It's fascinating if you want to understand why our buildings are ugly these days. Um, and I'm going to explain a little bit of it today. But uh, she, they followed the eyes, and then like, you know, over a 30-second period, this is where the eyes went, okay? And so they did about 30 people, and they found that on this building, right, the, the number one place that everybody's eyes rested was, you know, kind of these areas. And, and going to the statuary and going to, the, to the, those things was, was the other interesting pieces. Now, what's interesting is, you know, this is a modern building. This is the Queens Library in New York. Where do you think everybody's eyes went? Do I? They went to this yoga person over here. Okay, <laughs> they the, the, the two the two spots were over here, right, and bound here on this bus. Okay, no one's looking at the building, which is fascinating because, uh, you know, and, and what she gets into and what she what she shows is that there's here's another two building. This is a, a library. This is a historic building. And she's showing that, you know, the majority of the attention ends up right here, okay, and these two. Now, what does that look like? A face, a face right? And so what they found is, is that the, the face, and that, you know, that kid's drawing where you ask the kid to, to draw a house and they do this, and there's, you know, two eyes and a door. They found that this is... In, uh, she, she did a study and she looked at the, the origins of these people and where they, were, where they were living. It was like China, Russia, you know, Singapore, America, Canada, Mexico. All over the world, everybody drew this same kind of face, young kids drawing this face. And so there is a, a connection that we're making to our buildings that, you know, cars are the same way. Sometimes cars look like a face with the two headlights. And they do that on purpose. But if you look at this library, people's eyes are, are on the edges of the building, okay? And, you know, the book, the book spot. I mean, no one's looking at this, right? It's ugly. It's, 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 not, it's not warm. It's not inviting. And um, it's, it's a fascinating study. And I bring it up because... Um, I'm hoping that, that there's, there's, it's a fascinating video and you need to read her stuff and the book is good so far, um, but it explains, it helps explain kind of, kind of uh, as the, if you type in neurism and architecture and beauty uh, into an Amazon search, there's like six books out there now. Don Ruggles' book was one of the first ones I knew about, but there's a lot of people writing about it. And this eye motion technology is really teaching people a lot about architecture. And, and it's important because, you know, the biometrics, uh, people ignore blank facades, right? How buildings make us feel, right? And so they're, they're talking about there's actually a happiness factor that when people look at a building that's pleasing, they actually smile, and they're actually judging this by their looking on the face. What's fascinating is she talks about the fathers of modern architecture, Mies van der Rohe, Gropius, and Le Cubier CA. What's fascinating is these two guys grew up at the same time and both went through World War I. And World War I was, you know, they basically have post-traumatic stress disorders. And when you have that, you end up losing uh, the ability to, to draw and uh, to focus on detail. I mean, this basically is Gropius's house in, in, in Wash, in, uh, outside of Massachusetts. That's a German pill bunker. There's <laughs> things that are going on there. So we end up with these buildings that are very impersonal, right? And so the leading designers during that time period you know, had just gone through this very traumatic uh, issue with World War I, and they end up driving this, this philosophy that, that really sends us down a, uh, an ugly path, right? You think of like, like our, our commercial buildings today in strip malls. There's a book called The Geography of Nowhere, where, you know, this guy describes going to, you know, pulling up to a strip mall and saying, you know, where am I? Am I in, you know, Denver, California, Boston? Because all strip malls look the same. So we've, we've depersonalized and lost some of this stuff. A little bit of a rabbit trail here, guys, but I'm, I'm thinking that, that some of this uh, training and some of this teaching that, that will help people realize that 
We, we shouldn't be building b ugly things because there is an emotional uh, uh, attachment that goes on with these things that make us feel better and can make us happy, right? And so when you think about building communities and building places that are beautiful, shouldn't we do things that make us happy, not things that make us think things ugly? So the, 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 the last challenge, okay, is that basically, capitalistically, okay, you, you can go build a house, you can go be a builder and a developer with very little skill and still make a lot of money, okay? And so, uh, you know, what happens is these people without skill are able to produce an adequate product that is okay, right? They're able to, you know, they spruce up the front of a house enough to make it look interesting and they can sell it. And then they go, well, my designs are really good because they sell, right? But, you know, this isn't a positive or negative, it's just a fact that, you know, we've also got this price per square foot system that the bankers rely on, that the realtors rely on, that, that everybody relies on, and so we're all focused on cost, and we're not focused on value, and certainly not focused on beauty, but, uh, um, so there's this thing, right? So now, <laughs> why do we have ugly houses? Builders are in charge of design, architects are disengaged, homeowners don't know, and the system, right, encourages it. So, it's a challenge. Isn't this uplifting? <laughs> so, there, there's, there's also kind of this loss of classical detailing, and so, you know, and, and understanding of classical elements, right, in this house here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Um, and, and what's happened is these traditional details that we used to understand, their purpose, right, we, we, we now treat as stickers. And they're just like, well, I need something traditional on there, so uh, I'm going to put a column there where it doesn't belong and it looks silly. Um, I'm doing, this is, these are some of my Wednesday videos. And so uh, I went to this house and it was just kind of uh, just looking at it going, how could we make this better? You know, how could we fix this? And, and really, when you get down to it, it it's, it's all of the little details in here. It's the proportion of this column. It's the fact that this column has no emphasis. It's the fact that this is kind of ugly and gross. It's the spacing of the columns. It's the size of the dormers. It's the, it's the way the roof is done. And so, you know, I drew over top of that and just said, look, if I took that same house, I did a properly proportioned columns, I did a more reasonable entry, fix the dormers, you know, that house can be really a lot better, you know, all I'm doing is tweaking details, right? All I'm doing is I've changed the column size, so it has better proportions. I've fixed the entablature above, which this, you know, all the parts and pieces are in the wrong place. You know, I've changed the, I've made the door, you know, correspond to more historical precedent, right? Still give them something that's impressive, but you know, it, it has an architectural precedent. And so, you know, just there's a few things that we can fix. And so maybe we're close, right? Maybe we're, we're not as far away as we think we are. But, but this to me, in my mind, just kind of expresses that, you know, it's about five or six, eight things on this house that if I just tweak these little details, um, you know, the, the, one of the things I talk about is on dormers is that the, the face of the dormer should be like, if you, if you have a dormer, the percentage of glass to the face, this face, should be about 80%, okay? You get into these things where it's about 50% or less, and sometimes you'll see these dormers with, you know, you have a big dormer on a house, and then you'll have a little window, right? And so it's just, there, there's an historic precedent that makes things better, makes things more beautiful, that kind of we've forgotten. This was one of the houses I was, I was fixing, as I've talked about. And, you know, I, I basically, you know, fixed, again, about five elements, okay? One, I took out all the, all the bump ups, all the, these uh, round windows. I brought the door forward. I've, you know, taken out the coining. I fixed the entablature and tried to give them something impressive, but something filled with more historic precedent and, you know, I think it improves that house. So then you start going, okay, well, maybe we're close. Maybe we're not that far away from, from, from being good. One of the ideas is that 
today we don't really have a style of houses. Like what style is that, right? It, it's a house, right? It's a house style. And so, um, but historically, there was a design philosophy that on this arts and crafts house, you know, all these brackets are simple and they're unornamented because the, 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 the uh, functional you know, nature of it is the ornamentation. And so there's simple details and you go inside and the trim is all stain gray because we're gonna let the natural beauty of the wood and the, the hardware and all those different things are conforming to a style, to a design philosophy. And today houses are assembled, right? They're, they're kind of put together from a, you know, go pick your brick, go pick your windows, go pick your hardware. And so, you know, the homeowner goes to, you know, the, the hardware store and goes, well, that's pretty, you know, no reference to any kind of style or design philosophy. And we end up with assembled houses. What style is that? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, Again, we got a plating window. Yeah, uh, we got two plating windows. Look at that. There's another, that, that's that same design details. The double plating window style house. Um, again, same thing, right? I mean, they, they're almost like, well, am I looking at the same house, right? Same neighborhood. <laughs> it could be the same neighborhood. <laughs> it's beginning to look like a little bit of a dental office, isn't it? Um, going back even further, right? So this is probably a Tudor style house because you've got the diamond pane windows in the timbering, but we all know that that's not Tudor, right? So we end up with these houses and the other thing that's happening, it's all these bad things that are happening. I really am not as negative as I, as I may sound, but, but I, also, I also want you to realize kind of how these, what's happening. And when you look at these houses, kind of how we got there, because you know, I talk about one of my videos, I said, you know, we used to design houses from the uh, outside in, okay, in that the view from the outside was really important. And I, I was showing a house over here, McFarland House, that had a window, stained glass window in a closet. And I was like, that would never happen today. And, you know, the, the way houses are designed today is they sit down with someone, they say, well, you know, I need a kitchen, and I need it to open to the family room, and then I want a master, and on the other side of the house, I want the kids' rooms, and over here, I need an exercise room, and then what, don't forget about the big three-car garage. And so you end up with these houses, and then they go, oh, uh, what style do you want it to be? Uh, something traditional, right? Or whatever they say. And so you end up with a house like this, right? That has bump, 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 big bump, right? Just, and all these disparate parts that, you know, again, what style is this? Well, there's a barrel tile roof, so maybe it's Mediterranean. Um, but that's about it, right? And so you end up with these, you know, ugly houses that, that don't make sense. And so this was my fix. I'd, I'd actually kind of wanted to get rid of that. But by trying to create some co cohesive hole by, by, by dropping down the outside of that massive piece in the back, try to bring some symmetry in between the windows, right? I'm, I'm trying to take traditional details and, you know, fix a house. Where's the front door? Under the porch I think it's, I think it's here. But the hiding front door is a whole nother problem that happens on these houses. Um, you know, and then the last piece of this, you know, positive energy I'm <laughs> sending to the room. Um, you guys are just getting down and down. <laughs> there's, there's really good stuff coming. Um, I think that the DIY is uh, another contributing factor to, to why our houses are, you know, not where they could be. Uh, interestingly, you know, DIY started in the 50s, okay? Um, this was an article, 54, uh, in Time Magazine, uh, that there was a lot of vets coming back from World War II and uh, that were, were uh, wanting to do, wanting to build things, wanting to do stuff. And so they, this is an article, you know, listing the number of people that have shops in their basements, you know, from rich, you know, CEOs and executives all the way down to just your, your guy wanting to fix his car. There, you know, there is a joy in making. There is, there is, you know, satisfaction in building something. They're talking about 
people working in big high-rise buildings that don't have anything to show for their work and wanting to do these things. So the DIY movement grows from and is still fueled by our desire to make. Um, one of the things they noted was that tool manufacturers in 39 before the war did about three million dollars and then ten times that after the war. In other words, they weren't selling only to, to, uh, to professionals anymore, they were selling to homeowners and it exploded the number of tools that were being sold. Fast forward to today, you know, what percentage of, of uh, people at Home Depot are professionals? Of peop that people that shop at Home Depot, what, do you, what percentage do you think that are professionals? Shop there, shop there. Work there is zero. Shop, I don't know. Their percentage of professional people that shop there is 10%. So, majority of the people, now, there's about, I think it's like 40% 40, 40 of the revenue, right? Um, but a very small percentage of professionals. Most, the, the reason Home Depot is what it is today is because of DIY because of people you know, doing showers and doing, you know, doing tile projects, doing things in their house, which is great, okay? Um, I have no problem with that. You know, HGTV, Magnolia Network, all that kind of stuff. The problem is, is that, and this is where, this isn't a good or a bad thing, it's, a, it's just a thing, is that um, every, because it's such a huge volume of dollars, manufacturers, tool makers, all these things catered now to, the, to a home you know, a non-professional market. And you end up with products that snap together. You end up with things that are meant to be installed, uh, not crafted. And so, again, it's just, it's just like our capital system and, and the price per square foot, it is what it is, and it, but it does influence it. It does influence design, it does influence craft, and it does influence how houses are built. Um, so. There is a, the irony in technology, okay? Basically, our best built, longest lasting buildings were built during a time of very low technology. No power tools, no AutoCAD. These buildings lasted, you know, hundreds and thousands of years. The same thing is tool, true, tool, <laughs> easy for me to say, true with tools. <laughs> Tools are getting better and better all the time, okay? But craft is actually suffering because tools are so good, right? We no longer have to learn how to drive a nail with a hammer because nail guns are so good and efficient, right? And so it's, you know, it, again, it is what it is. Um, faster construction, shorter life, ironically, um, is changing things. Okay, that's enough of the negative stuff. Yay, ready to take a break. Um, I wanted to just, before I get into the positive things, talk about the current state of home building, kind of lay out what's out there. Do uh, you have any questions before we go there? Yeah. Um, when you're looking at modern and talking about it, now that everything's automated, what about the modern houses that were built in the 40s and the 50s compared to the, the houses that were built before that in the different styles? Well, I mean, modern, you know, early modern houses are like, you know, ranches and mid-century modern houses. That's the very first kind of modern style, unless you wanted to go back to like, there's not many of them, international style houses or something like that. I think there's one in Fort Worth or two. Um, but, yeah. The question is, um, what about the houses, the modern houses that were built in the 50s, right? How have they held up, right? How, the, you know, how they've stood the test of time? Is that the question? Yes, and how it's compared to today. I mean, if it looks good on the outside, it must be good on the inside, and it's not always the case. So um, realize that a modern house, okay, and, and what Levitt was doing with his things were very cheap, okay? And, and so, you know, Sometimes you'll go into houses in the 50s and they won't even have hardwood floors in them, right? They'll, they'll have, you know, plywood floors and carpet, right? And so um, the materials, hollow core doors, uh, you know, aluminum extruded windows, um, you know, you know wood, wood, it went from wood windows to aluminum windows, right? All those different things were cheaper ways of building. So you end up, you know, 
I live in a 1962 house, right? And I have some of those aluminum extruded windows. Um, my house is okay. Uh, I don't think it has the design, you know, uh, appeal that, that I think earlier houses, pre-1940 houses have. But uh, they were just cheap houses. And so cheap materials, I think, you know, built fairly solidly. But, you know, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, all right. So the state of home building. Um, I just, I just figured that there's kind of three categories of, you know, you know, there's the entry level house, right? And then there's the kind of middle, middle second home, second, third home. And then there's the, the forever home, the, the big million dollar mansion or whatever. This is, I just Zillowed, you know, $300,000 house kind of what's the entry level house in Fort Worth. And this is it. So this is what you get for $300,000. This is that forward front, you know, garage. They, sometimes they're called snout nose houses because the garage sticks so far forward. This is a tool by builders to reduce the amount of concrete that they have to pour. Uh, there's no alleys. Things aren't done in the back. So they have to put the garage very close to the street. So it's less concrete and it saves them money. Um, again, we're, we're not talking really about a style. There, this house, I think I've got... Uh, is in this neighborhood, right? It's right there. Uh, it's around, built around a school, uh, a, a close neighborhood school. This is the inside of it. Uh, I really hadn't looked at many $300,000 houses, so I thought it was interesting. Very little trim, you know, faux wood floors, a lot of sheetrock. Um, you know, a, a small kitchen, um, but, and this is what you're getting in a backyard, right? And then they've switched to cheaper materials once they come around the back. Interestingly, Texas is a brick market, so brick's very important. If this house was built in Kansas City, mostly would have been siding, and they would interchange the siding with wood windows. So they'd have a wood window on a cheaper house, but they wouldn't have any brick. So all these games, these by market kind of, brick is perceived to be a superior product in our market. So this is what you get for $300,000 in Fort Worth today. This is the $800,000 version, right, uh, of a house. Um, same kind of thing. This is your neighborhood. I think that's the house. Uh, maybe it's closer to a lake. Maybe you're getting a little bit more. This house to me looks like pretty much the same house with just two stories, right? Just more garage space and uh, a little bit bigger. The inside, very similar, right? Just these big, huge volumes. They've got an accent wall that they've afforded that. Maybe it's a better floor material. Maybe it's better kitchens at this point, um, but fairly similar. Now, in both these situations, um, they're, they're probably not dealing with an architect. You're probably dealing with the designer through the builder. Uh, there's very few choices that you would have. The plans for a house like this might be six, eight pages uh, at the most. You probably, as the homeowner, wouldn't really even be able to look at those plans. You'd be something the builder, builder would use. You might get a selections. You might get a, you go to their store. You can have one of these three floors. You can have one of these three countertops. Customization at that $300,000 level is pretty limited. It gets a little bit better in this category. Um, but, you know, that's kind of what you're dealing with. And then... I. I started looking, this is a $10 million home. This is up in Vaquero, so this is a very nice neighborhood. Now, what's happened is, is that now we've got, you know, an architect, uh, I think this is Lake Flato is what they said, very, you know, uh, modern, traditional modern, uh, because they're doing Texas vernacular stuff. Um, but you get an architect, you get a designer, you get nicer materials, you get nicer, you know, uh, cabinetry, obviously a nicer neighborhood. This is in Vaquero, that's the house there. Um, you know, you get, you know, when you're building a house like that, you get a $200,000 stove, um, custom, custom stonework, custom woodwork, pretty much everything's custom. You most likely have an interior designer. You have an architect. The plans for this house probably have 50 pages of plans with a lot of architectural details, a lot of, uh, of calling out of the materials. Uh, wood windows, most things are probably custom in here. The doors, uh, you know, the, the, the flooring, uh, all of those different things. There will be a design philosophy with a house like this. There will be, you know, uh, like I said, like that Lake Flato, Texas vernacular kind of modernism. Um, you're going to get those materials and those things. It's going to be cohesive. And so, um, 
you know, there, there's a big jump taking place there. And uh, I might have jumped too much. This is a, an old house. So let's say you don't want to go the new house route. This is an older house, right? You get a fireplace, you know, uh, in, this, in a house like this, brick, wood windows. Um, this is the interior. Obviously, it's an older space, probably a 40s or 50s house. Uh, you get some funky details if you like those kind of fun things in houses. Backyard, older trees, bigger trees. There's a wood shop in here. There's a wood shop in here, <laughs> so you know which one I would choose. Um, and, then I, and then I did, you know, that 800 to a million two thing, and this is the house actually over here in Berkeley. Um, you know, you get Ludovici tile roof, you get brick, wood windows, nice architectural details, um, you know, custom architectural details, hard to find, things like that. It's an older house, closets are probably smaller, kitchen may need to be redone, but uh, I think there's more charm there. This, this is, uh, it's, it's a, I think it's plaster with a scored surface that makes it look like cut stone. <clears throat> um, you know, obviously bigger trees, detached garage. Uh, where would you rather spend your money? There. Right? I mean, in these older things, there's, there's more charm, there's more value, there's more uh, original material. Wood, if you like wood moldings and things like that, you're going to get that better tile. Um, and so... I really feel like, you know, there's kind of three categories. Production builders, they're building over 100 houses a year. You know, D.R. Horton builds 50,000 houses a year. Um, large uh, production builders were trying, I think, uh, around 1,000 houses a year, right? And so um, very few selections and options, hardly any customization. Uh, they are about volume. This custom builder thing is really the largest category. Um, of builders out there and and these guys can vary you know quite a bit from custom builders who offer you know three plans and you know a few selections and things like that they're probably building more like 30 houses a year or more but when you get into the guys that are building you know six eight ten houses a year they're going to offer more customization uh, they're going to be called custom builders they're still they're still most likely working from a stock set of plans um, you will, you know, it varies amount of selections and items you're going to get, but you're going to certainly pay for uh, any of those things you do. And then the high-end builders, less than 20 projects a year, uh, everything's customized, right? The plans are customized, the interior design's customized, right? That's your world. The, there was a funny quip from, from one of the, uh, um, Andres du Duani, talking about, you know, that high-end builders have clients, custom builders have customers, Production builders have victims. <laughs> so that, that's kind of the, the quip there. Um, any questions about that? I do. Yeah. Um, the high end builder does less than 20 projects. Obviously, the house is going to be very custom and with quality materials. But what about the customer that wants the production builder type stock <coughs> but has the money to spend? <laughs> so her, her, her question, or I think it's more of a comment, the, the, uh, is that um, what about the person who kind of wants, who has a lot of money, but really likes the more production builder styling, right? Or just the speed of it, maybe just, uh, just the way that works. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the great tragedy in building, in my mind, is the person who spends, you know, two million, three million, four million, and really... They have a custom builder building like a production builder with no design and no style and you end up with, I mean that house that I, that I was looking at back here, I think this is that house. Sorry. I think that's that house, right? I think that house is probably a million and a half, two million dollar house and I don't think it has good styling. I don't think it, it's appealing from the street. I think it's, you know, there are details in it that are, that are bad and so that's that's what you get. Did they buy that house or did they build it? This was a built house. Well, now the I have no idea who know, who who lives here or anything. I just were driving through neighborhoods taking oh, pictures. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, so I, yeah. I misunderstood. Yeah. No. Sorry. Um, 
but that's what happens. And so that, that to me is the, is the problem in building today is that you have, um, you know, people spending a lot of money and because the customer doesn't know, like they don't know who to go talk to. All happy people say, what architect should I talk to? Most of the people that come to us want us to pair them up with the architect that's right for them. And so, uh, you know, there's, I think I've said it before, I think there's, you know, eight architects in Texas that are any good, right? And so if you don't know them, how do you, you know, how do you know? And so if that person that I just showed their house, they have good intentions, right? They want to build a nice house. They've got a lot of money. But if they can get on that path of that, you know, this, this range, and you can get led to the slaughter, in my opinion. <laughs> um, now, I think functionally, they probably enjoy that house, right? I don't think it's contributory to the neighborhood. You know, I don't think it's beautiful, but, you know, they might love their house. So who am I, you know? Um, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, the question is, uh, you know, how did we end up with McMansions, right? right. Um, I, I think it's gamesmanship. I think it's, I think it's savvy business moves from, from builders who looked around and were building and saw a lot of competition in the, you know, three fifty dollars to $500,000 range and then looked at the million-dollar houses and said, I can do that. And, you know, basically found a designer to help them put a plan together, and it worked. And, you know, there's some guys building some spec houses in Dallas that, you know, well, I mean, the one out in California, do you ever hear about that house? They tried to sell it for $100 million. It was a spec house where you had like five, was it? I think he wanted, originally wanted $500 million. So this, it was a huge spec deal out in California, just a big ego, big guy who, who was on a 13 pools and there was a shark tank and there's all kinds of crazy stuff. It was, it was huge. Ended up went going to bankruptcy, but he's the kind of guy that that's just. Um, I, I think that's the mindset of these builders. You know, I can build that. You know, the DIY and them and, and knowing he can make money, and knowing that the customer doesn't know, and so they walk through a house. I remember we were doing a house in the Street of Dreams, uh, right before the crash. Yeah, it was like 2008, <laughs> right before the crash here in Texas. It was a little bit later, and. Uh, we were trying to sell a spec house that John Milner, an architect in New England, had, had designed for us. It was a beautiful mid-Atlantic house, and uh, we had one TV in it. And the house out at the Street of Dreams had 27 TVs in it. And I was scared because that was so showy, right, that, you know, I, the customer isn't educated. He doesn't, he doesn't really care about beautiful, right? I did 27 TVs in it. So, you know, that McMansions get built because the customer doesn't know, right? Sometimes the customer doesn't care, and that's fine. They, they don't have to care. <laughs> the big thing in this, in this thing for me is we used to build beautiful neighborhoods. We used to, there was an ideal, okay, that, that you build beautiful things, you have beautiful communities. And those things have kind of been lost. And so I'm an idealist. I'm, I'm a purist, right? And so... I'm talking about these things like, this is terrible. No, you know what? It happens all the time. And so, uh, but it does happen because of opportunity, because of ego, because of ignorance, right? It, 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 that's why it happens. And it happens a lot, unfortunately. Some of the wild cards in the future building that are, are going to be interesting to see, you know, one is prefab. We've been talking about prefab since the 40s. That's a 43, okay? Um, and the, and the, in the industry, the desire to build uh, houses like we build cars has been happening since the 30s, okay? And so, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright was building, designing Usonian houses, right, that, that, were, that were meant to be modularized and meant to be built. The Sears catalog, right, you could buy a house uh, from a Sears catalog. We talked about that. 
So um, I went out and visited this place, Blue Homes. Uh, they have a factory in California. This is uh, three bedroom, four, three bath, 2,100 square foot, $625,000. And that house comes to you uh, on your land and they deliver it on a truck. And uh, there's, there's these modularized pieces. And um, I think they, they was gonna be built in three weeks, something like that. Once it came from the factory, we went and visited the factory. We ended up not getting the piece of land we wanted, so we didn't end up doing the deal. But there's a lot of, of interesting uh, modularized things that are coming around. And there was a big one. Uh, there was one called Katana, Katari. Uh, what is it? Katera. Katera. They were a $2 billion. They were going to change building. They were going to change the, the whole infrastructure and completely vertically integrate. They went kaput. And so... Um, a lot of people have been trying to figure this out. I put it up as a wild card because it's interesting to me that, that there's a lot of people out there doing this. This is Ma, Ma Homes or Ma Modern or something um, that also does modularized houses like this. And so, you know, notice their thing, modular is architectural. Because a lot of, you know, the stigma against modular is the, you know, you know double wide, right? The, the stigma against the, in this industry against this style of house is the, is the cheap, you know, uh, trailer homes and trailer parks. And so they are wanting to be very cutting edge and very modern. Um, the tiny houses is another thing. This is another kind of camera. We house, I think is this. Um, also modular, I think this is a European company, but the tiny house movement is interesting. If you think about what Levitt did, okay, the average size house when Levitt was building was 1,200 to 1,400 square feet. His houses were 600 to 800 square feet, right? So he built a very small house. He did a tiny house thing in some ways. And so the tiny house movement is something. I'm not sure what happens. There's a lot of city uh, zoning and other kind of things that they have to figure out to make these developments work. But there is something there as we look ahead and look, try to figure out what's happening. Um, Austin and I, Austin back here, uh, did an AI search uh, and Philadelphia Georgian house styles. And so, you know, what is AI, what is AI capable of doing, right? And so these were two new houses built in colonial revival style, you know. They're not terrible, right? Uh, they're a little cartoonish, right? Um, but as AI gets better, um, it'll be interesting to see what it can do. Now, I fear that it's going to do gross stuff like this because we asked a diagram of a Georgian interior molding package, right? Uh, none of that is Georgian, by the way. Um, I mean, it's Victorian, right? And so um, it doesn't really know. This was what the federal style interiors. Uh, again, more Victorian than federal. Um, so there is something there though. AI is gonna get better and is gonna, is gonna get, uh, the reason I think it's gonna to appeal to people is because of cost. I think it's, uh, it's, it's not expensive to get these things, you know, to, to, to do these drawings and do these details. And so um, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. So this house reflects who we are and what we value. Unfortunately, right, they, you know, this sells all the time, right, all over the country. And so it does reflect our values as our houses do. But I also say that this too reflects our values and what we value. Um, and so we can get good houses today. The reason I do these buildings and brews is because I think the opportunity to build something beautiful is there and it doesn't have to cost more money. Um, it doesn't have to take longer. It just has to be designed right. And so um, with the right details. So reasons for optimism. Put a smile on your face. Here we go. This is the good stuff. Um, <clears throat> there's kind of the new urbanism. We'll talk about that. I think the rise of classical and classical design is great. Um, I think that there are still patrons willing to fund and encourage beautiful and quality things that is encouraging to me. <clears throat> Anybody been to Seaside, Florida? Really? Um, so Seaside is a 1980s development by these new urbanists, uh, Andres, 
Andreas Duwani and uh, his wife um, and their group, DPZ. And so this was a new development in Florida, 1980s. The Truman Show was here um, as this idyllic community, right? But it, we go there, uh, we've been there probably three or four times over the years. We've actually moved up the coast now. Um, but 30A is this development that has Seaside, Alice Beach, Rosemary Beach, and a bunch of other developments. And if you went here in 1980, they had, you know, th this thing was there, it was new and shiny, and it was beautiful. It was cohesively designed in that there was a design ph philosophy that this cottage, beach cottage, ideal Caribbean flavor was, was uh, the design ideal. You parked your car, you rode your bikes, it was front porches, sidewalks, and it really was a wonderful community. It was built around, you know, a, a, a town center, um, and it was built, you know, with the idea, new urbanists basically have this idea that, you know, in the 1920s, and you can see it over there if you go into uh, Berkeley and uh, Park Hill in that area, there was a local school, there was a local store, you know, the local church, so you could walk everywhere. It did not require you getting into a car to live your life, whereas now you've got, you know, the industrial complex, the shopping mall, the gated community, you know, and so you have to drive to each one of those things in order to get around. Seaside was the first one, um, and it's, it's really a unique community. Up the beach, they, they did about six miles up the road, they did Rosemary Beach. Um, same group, uh, different stylings, more uh, European Caribbean, right? Uh, kind of ideals and things like that, um, with, again, with the town center. Um, and what they found is that as these communities kept growing is that all the surrounding houses and communities got better. So what typically was a cheap beach house, you know, right on the, right on the water that was, you know, built for a hundred grand would be torn down and a million dollar property would be put up because this model showed people that good design and, and quality construction did attract people, did raise values, and did improve the, improve the landscape. And then Alice Beach is next door to Rosemary Beach. It too has a Bermuda uh, um, flavor, but kind of this, this rustic, uh, you know, uh, early Bermuda house style um, that's, that's really charming and beautiful. When it's done well, it, it improves value and everything goes up. Um, inspired good design, following a clear design philosophy. We talked about those houses that have no style today. You know, we need clear design philosophies to, uh, to build with, to build, build, build better with. Anybody heard of the traditional neighborhood development, traditional neighborhood design? So TNDs, okay, started in about 1990 not coincidentally after, you know, Seaside started in the 80s, um, as a design movement that changed to, uh, that mandated front porches, mandated sidewalks, right? You think about a, a 19, uh, I have a 1960s neighborhood, no sidewalks. You go over to Berkeley, 1930s neighborhood, there's sidewalks, right? Between the wars, between that 30 year period, Builders and developers, you know, no longer had sidewalks, no longer have front porches. This is going back to that design ideal and design movement. So what you have is you have um, <clears throat> large builders and large developers, even D.R. Horton, going into and wanting to build houses in traditional neighborhood developments uh, because it works, right? Because that design, uh, that idea works. And so you do end up having a design philosophy. The execution, isn't always the best when you have these, you know, uh, high production builders trying to do it, but it is a start and a move in the right direction. And what was I saying there? Uh, yeah, it just, it, it was pointed out that it raised the bar for other areas in the thing that everything got better after those developments started. <clears throat> um, the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, okay, that's, there's a Texas chapter. I was a part of it for a long while. Alice is on the board now. Um, but this is some of the work that comes out of this. This is an award winner. There's a Staub Awards. Uh, beautifully designed, beautifully executed, uh, well-made houses still happening today, still winning awards, still you know, beautifully constructed. Um, and this hark these houses and this level of building harkens back to an old way of building and an old way of designing uh, 
with, with, with really neat, wonderful details and architects who care about those traditional details and how to execute them right and how to execute them properly. So uh, there's commercial buildings. This is Harlan Crow's Parkland over in Dallas. Um, but there is an infiltration of classical architects, you know, getting involved in design, getting involved in things because we realize that, you know, we've forgotten how to build a column and an entablature, right? And so classical architects are, you know, raising the bar and improving design, uh, you know, in their work. And so there's there are 14 chapters around the country, two in California, there's one in New York, but, you know, the ICAA, if you, is a great learning institution. They have newsletters and talks all the time. If you want to learn more about this, you know, that's where I would start. My building career kind of has three tiers, right? I have the preservation tier, where I first learned about preservation in Boston. I have the classical tier, where I learned all about classicism. That happened, you know, right around 2010, 2000. Eight, I didn't really know that much about this. Now I, now I do. I learned a lot of from, from there. And now my latest tier is the build science tier, learning about how to build in a build science -y way. So very important uh, that that was a, a learning time for me is that classicism. And so just beautiful things being done. There's also a national awards called the Palladio Awards. <coughs> and really what you'll hear from architects on this on the Palladio Awards. So Palladio Awards is sponsored by Traditional Building Magazine um, and Period Home Magazine. And the architects who design in this manner, design in the traditional manner, there are no, there is no place to get awarded for the work that we do. The Palladio Awards was the first place that started honoring some of this stuff. If you look at, you know, the you know, Home Builder Awards for the best design, it's all modern crap. My opinion. Uh, remodelers Awards the same way. We don't enter into any remodeling magazine awards because we know we're not going to win because they have modern architects judging that stuff. They don't understand traditional things. They don't know how to look at it. And so, you know, we're just speaking a different language. And so the Palladio Awards, again, is another place. And a lot of commercial buildings, a lot of institutional things happening in here, but um, great design, great building, great tradition still happening uh, around the country. So, how do you get a good house today? <laughs> yeah, Cla class is done. Uh, she said, she said, I said, how do you get an old house? She said, buy an old house. How do you get a good house? Buy an old house. Um, I agree with that, right? I think that I was showing kind of that, that world. I would, you know, if you gave me half a million dollars to go buy a house, there's no way I'm buying that new stuff. One, it's ugly, but two, I don't think it's built very well. I think it's disposable. The products and the materials that they have in those houses, I don't think they're built to last. Um, I think you've got to fight. Uh, rage against the machine. Um, there's an there's a influencer on, on Instagram, Makerista. Anybody follow her? Uh, uh, I helped her with her Greek revival house in Kansas City. And over and over and over again, she would call and talk about, well, how do I get the stairs right? They say I can't do this old stair rail. I go, you can do the old stair rail. You just need to, you know, you can do the old stair rail. Well, they say it has to be 42 inches high. It does not have to be 42 inches high. And what happens is you have the stair guy, you know, used to his standard way of building things. You have the code person, you have the builder, you have a lot of people talking and telling her you can't do that historic stair rail. Well, she put the historic stair rail in, but it was a major fight for her to get that. She's trying to put the, the fireplace in. They go, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. We do it all the time. And so <laughs> it's really hard to build a good house today. And I've used the analogy about food. You know, go to go to 7-Eleven, try to get something healthy, right? You're on a road trip and you're driving, you stop at a gas station. You might get a banana and you might get an apple, right? But most of it's junk. And so most things that builders, craftsmen, code people, architects are going to tell you isn't right. I should, I got to be careful. Um, nope, I'm going to stick with it. <laughs> um, there's just a lot of misinformation out there about... Um, about how to build right. And now with build science and all those things that you can't, you know, the air infiltration and everything else, it's really hard 
and you've got to find the right team that's going to help you manage this process because you can get in quite a bit of trouble. This, though, this is educate, educate, educate. This is me educating the clients. This is me educating myself. This is me traveling and doing things. It is really hard to get a great house today if you are, you know, I've got $500,000, what do I do? Um, I really do believe that you don't start with a new house prospect. Um, I think you, I would probably try to maximize my dollars with an, with an older house. And if I wanted to build a house, I'd probably wait till I had you know, a million dollars, right? Um, maybe, maybe eight, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars and work really hard on the design, work really hard with the right architect to get the right details in place and as simple things. It's like uh, the size of the column. It's the, the, the proportion of the windows. Um, it's the brick, right? And so there, there's all these tricks in order to, to get a well-made house today but at the $300,000 level, go buy an old house, right? You're never, you can't get there. And so um, I think that when you get up into the 750 range, at least in Texas, right, say that range, you can start making some compromises and making some decisions. You're probably, uh, you know, you're not gonna get the typical $750,000 house, will be, let's do the easy math, $800,000 house at, you know, uh, 100 a foot, 8,000 square feet, and that's, that's probably too big. 6,000 6, square feet, you're probably gonna be at about 3,500 square feet, right? You're probably gonna be knocking down the amount of square footage in your house in order to get better quality, in order to get better design, but that's the piece you're managing to do that cost thing. And look, to go put that more expensive house per square foot into a development like I was showing you before, you can't do that either. So now you're doing infill housing because the banks most likely won't lend you money to go build that house in that development because, well, that doesn't, that's not, you know, the, 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 the neighborhood or the neighbor's houses or the comps in that area aren't going to, aren't going to allow for that. And so they're going to really restrict you, right? So now you're fighting the banker, you're fighting the mortgage people, you're fighting, you know, the builder who says, I can build you more than that. And so it's hard, guys. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get a good house built today because this environment that I've talked about is so weighted against you to build something beautiful. It's so weighted, it's so cost driven and not design driven that, uh, and if you try to find a designer who understands their traditional things, it's really, really hard. So. Um, good luck. <laughs> um, the, uh, but if you do these things, if you educate yourself, you're not going to fall into those traps and fall into those things that gets, you know, the $2 million house that looks like, you know, crap, that looks terrible, right? You do, that doesn't happen to you as you educate yourself, as you travel, as you see more beautiful things. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, probably a little of both. Um, the, the question is, what changed? Whether the customer changed, or the, or the, you know, the, the, you know, why, why did, did, if I'm saying this right, you know, why are we accepting those houses now? Um, I think there's a little bit of, you know, if you read the stories about Levitt and what he was, what he was offering to the people, um, you know, it, it was a, a washing machine. It was a, a yard. He had to teach people how to mow the grass because they didn't know how to mow the grass, right? And so there was a, that 30 year time or 20 year time span between the end of the Great Depression and the end of World War II, um, it, it, it really changed uh, people's perception. So they got so much more for their money when they moved to a Levitt house. They got more square footage. They got, you know, their own house. They got their own yard. They got fruit trees. Um, that there was, a, there was a little bit of that mass consumerism, mass, uh, 
you know, you look at all the products that are available in the houses, the, the, the stoves and the way they work, the, the uh, uh, vacuum cleaners, TVs. There was a mass consumerism that took place in that 50s, 60s, 70s that I think spoiled a lot of people. We were building uh, these houses and, uh, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And so I think the customers got spoiled and lazy and the builders, you know, never looked back, right? So it's cheaper and faster for them to build without good design, right? And so then to slow down and get work on through all these design details. And so um, it's a little bit, you know, self-perpetuating. It's a little bit, um, yeah, it's hard because I can't think of like a good design development in the 70s, right? So if you get out of World War II and you start building houses in the 50s and 60s, and by the 70s, you're kind of looking around and there's nothing there, you know, it's, it's I don't know if I, I just kind of rambled there for a little while. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. The real estate agents and the Fannie Freddie loans and all that stuff share some of the blame too. <clears throat> they do, they do. In, in, in fact, they won't, you know, qualify certain house styles. The modernists would complain that, that um, that the FHA wouldn't allow them to build certain styles of houses and things like that, but there's no doubt they're part of that problem. So, any other questions? Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it.